My name is Mark Kligman. I'm the director of the Lowell Milken Fund for American Jewish Music at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. I'm on the faculty at UCLA and also hold the Mickey Katz and Dad Chair in Jewish Music. I'm joined by my colleague, Lori Black, who is uh, helping us very closely. And just to give a big thanks to Beth Kramer, who is also uh, our manager and our coordinator for our programs. Uh, before I introduce our guest for today, we just want to thank you all for joining us. We're going to start this series as of tonight and go for the next uh, eight or nine weeks. Uh, we're lining up other wonderful people to uh, join us. And our goal at UCLA as we develop various programs in Jewish music and concerts, uh, curating new works, uh, doing uh, academic research, we also want to provide another point of contact with the community through this program we're calling the Virtual Jewish Music Masterclass. So it gives me, uh, it's a great honor for us to introduce Sheila Silver, who has written a wide range of works in various media, from solo works to instrumental works, and large orchestra works to opera and feature film. And her musical language is a synthesis between tonal and atonal music, music with a great degree of rhythmic complexity, which we'll be hearing tonight. She has studied both in America and in Europe, and she has studied with noted composers such as Ligeti. She has had commissions from major orchestras such as the Los Angeles Philharmonic, Chicago String Ensemble, many other US organizations and ensembles as well as in Europe. She's received many honors, including the Rome Prize, awards from the National Endowment of the Arts, the New York State Council of the Arts, and many others. She lives in upstate New York where she's joining us today. And she recently retired from the State University of New York in Stony Brook. So again, we welcome Sheila Silver and we look forward to this wonderful format where you'll get to hear from Sheila about her background, her music, and we'll hear um, some wonderful music. So Sheila Silver, thank you. Thanks, Mark, and hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Lori, and thank you both for uh, guiding me through uh, how to do it. My, this is my first Zoom lecture or talk, so there's a learning curve, but I think we've got it all down, and thank you for your patience uh, while, I, while you guided me through that. So I'm happy to share some thoughts today about how Jewish melody and how my Jewish identity has influenced some of my music. Um, when you're an artist, life informs your art and art informs your life. I guess another way of saying that is that the process of conceiving and then composing a piece of music is um, a journey that becomes your life. You can't really separate the two. Sometimes I'm interested in something and it ends up in my music. And sometimes I have an idea for music and I have to do all the research and then I learn a whole lot about something. So everything is, each piece has becomes a life journey. I would say that's really true. And uh, my Jewish identity was initially formed uh, growing up in Seattle, Washington. We were members of Temple de Hirsch, which was a reformed temple. But we had Orthodox grandparents, so going to their house was always like entering another world. They were immigrants and from Russia, and um, my grandfather spoke Yiddish, but we never learned Yiddish. And especially Jewish summer camps, because I think there's a lot of heart stuff that goes on in the Jewish summer camps. And I went to, we went to one called Camp Saratoga. I think it later became Camp Swig or something like that. But it really helped develop Jewish identity. So I, I think the camps are important. And then when I was 30 and I was single and I was living on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and I had done a lot of yoga and was all into this Eastern mysticism, and I said, well, you know, I don't know anything about my own background, so I want to go back and kind of explore my Jewish roots in a different way. And, of course, on the Upper West Side, there were uh, tons of synagogues, all kinds of Orthodox, Hasidic, New Age synagogues to explore with. And... And I met many wonderful teachers and people, but the most important 
influence on me was Reb Elihaim Karlbach, and he was the twin brother of Shlomo. And many of you know Shlomo as the storytelling, singing, uh, he wrote many of the songs that people sing in synagogues today. And he was very outgoing and did outreach. And Reb, Shlom, and Reb Elihaim was completely the opposite. He was very shy and very quiet and uh, a lovely man and very learned and, um, and very devoted to his Yiddishkeit. And he, he had an incredible musical memory. And he could remember any nigun he had ever heard in his entire life. And he'd be sitting at Shabbat's, uh, Shabbat table and he'd say, I remember so-and-so, Reb so-and-so sang this back in 1935. And then he would proceed to sing the entire nigun from start to finish flawlessly and beautifully. So naturally, I, so I got a real taste of authentic nigunim from him and from hanging around him and his wonderful wife, Hadassah Karlbach. And he was very supportive when I started writing my own nigunim. And in particular, I, um, um, one day I, um, uh, I was going to a, a lunch, a Shabbat, a Shabbat lunch, and I was Shomer Shabbat at the time, so I was walking. And I was walking from the Upper West Side down to the Lower Teens, and I... Um, Decided it was a 90 minute walk, it was a sunny day, and I decided that I was going to write a melody for Shalom Aleichem. And um, so I did. And then I sang it for him, and he encouraged me. And so I, 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 that's going to segue into um, the first piece I want to play. I was going to, this was the second nigun I wrote. The first one was for a piece called Song of Sarah, which the Milken Archive has recorded, and you can get that on Noxos. I won't talk too much about that now, except that, um, that except that in, the, in Mark's introduction, he talked about uh, a mixture of my my language having a mixture of tonal and um, atonal music, and using you know when when I was growing up as a composer, uh, using tonal melodies was frowned upon by the teachers, by the academia that I grew up in. And when I first started using nigunim in my music, it was an opportunity to introduce very tonal melodies, but mix them in contexts that might be differently uh, placed. In other words, a perspective of 21st or 20th century. So um, the first one I wrote was for Song of Sarah, but that's uh, there's an interview online about that piece, so I won't go into that more. So let's talk about the cello sonata. So first I need to sing for you Sholom Aleichem, the, 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 the melody I wrote. So first I'm going to do that. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the piece now. Okay, so everybody who knows me knows that I'm obsessed with Tibetan singing bowls. And um, I said to Mark, you know, I don't really want to sing it. I mean, of course, if it was Friday night, you would sing it with no, with no musical s support. And, you know, if you were Shlomo, you'd sing it with a guitar if it were not Friday night. So I'm going to sing it, since it's not Friday night, with a Tibetan bull because it um, it's the drone. It's the, it's the dough. Okay. How about? Shalom Aleichem Mahe Ashore Okay, so that's the, that's the Shalom Aleichem tune. I'll put it down on the floor there. And then 
now we want to hear it, okay, in this cello sonata. So the f first thing I did was give the theme to the cello solo. And then I brought in, in the second, first variation. Oh, I should just say something quickly about a theme and variation form. Um, it's a fun form because you get to vary, you get to keep repeating the theme, but varying it in all kinds of ways. And being a classically trained composer and having spent a lot of time with Beethoven and Brahms variations, you, they always would vary the theme, that means the melody, the rhythm, and um, the harmony. Those are the things you get to get varied. And usually the phrase structures say mostly the same. Um, so in, in, in my variations, I get to vary those three things, but I also get to change aesthetics and worlds, harmonic world, world sounds between each variation. So they're very radically different one to the next. So you're gonna hear the theme, and then you're going to hear the first variation. And in the first variation, I bring in the piano. And the piano is playing these mysterious chords. And so I took this tonal melody, which is the theme, and then I punctuate it with very mysterious chords, not what you would expect if, it was, if they were tonal chords. And then the rest of the cello sonata... Um, kind of gets to play between these strange chords and the uh, tune. And I'm going to then switch, because it's we don't have tons of time, I'm going to switch forward um, to the second to the last variation, which is kind of a dance, and then the fin what we call the finale. And traditionally, even in Brahms and Beethoven, the last variation would be could be freer formed and more expansive. And my finale for this is freer formed and more expansive. And at the very end of that, the piano states the original tune again, very simply. Remember, the cello had at the beginning, now the piano gets it. But the harmonic sound world is a little different. I think it's rather whole tone-ish. And this recording is by cellist Timothy Eddy and pianist Gilbert Kalish, and it was uh, recorded in 1989. It was written in 1988, recorded in 89. And um, uh, they, Gil Kalish especially has been a colleague of mine, and I've written many other pieces for him, but this was the first piece I wrote for him and Tim, and they're both wonderful friends and colleagues and magnificent music, uh, musicians. So um, now we're going to hear the theme and the first variation, and then the last second to the last variation and the finale of the second movement.
So that was the um, second movement of the cello sonata. Mark, did, we had some technical difficulties. Did you hear them or did I just hear them? 
I, I didn't hear anything. I'm sorry. It, did anyone else hear them? I, did anybody else hear technical difficulties or was it just me? <laughs> Unmuted. Heard some difficulties. It got yeah, out yeah. Yeah. It times. cut out several times. Yeah. Yeah, from time to time. Hmm. hmm. So it didn't sound that way to you. Not on my end. All right. Let's hope that um, the internet connection stays stable. All right. Okay. Well, anyway, let's let's do our best to keep going. Um, we I'm, mostly had it though. Yeah, thank you. We mostly had it, just a, a dropout or two for a second. Yeah, I, I, yeah, all right. Well, we'll, we'll, it was, we'll just maybe, I don't know. Anyway, so now we're going to move on to the, um, to another piece called To the Spirit Unconquered. And that was um, written in 1992. It was premiered in 1992, probably written in 1991. And it was inspired by the writings of Primo Levi, whose two books, Survival at Auschwitz and The Reawakening, influenced me profoundly. Uh, at the time of composing, my husband John, who you saw run in here a few minutes ago, had been researching the Holocaust for a screenplay he was writing about a survivor. And I started reading what he was reading, and we read many books, did a lot of research, and m several of Primo Levi's books. Later, when I started to compose the piano trio, I decided to use a few images from my previous research. And while there's no distinctly Jewish musical theme, like my Sholem Aleichem that you just heard, uh, the subject is about the ability of the human spirit to demonstrate humanity in the face of inhumanity to survive and bear witness. In short, the triumph of the human spirit. Uh, as we are in the middle of a crisis right now, one which is not just a pandemic, but a crisis of humanity and civility, I would even say a crisis of inhumanity, both to the unempowered, but also to the earth, this piece still has a lot of re relevance for us today. Probably, unfortunately, in any time, there's something bad going on that this piece can relate to. But it also is about the transcendence of the bad times. So the piece has a program, meaning uh, I was taking images from, the, uh, from Levy's writings, and the first moment um, he stated in his book, uh, Survival at Auschwitz, that how when people uh, disembarked from the trains, uh, they would, or he was, filled with this uncontrollable fear and at the same time, he knew that if he didn't hold on to that fear and con and contain it, that he would be, uh, would you know, he would he would not survive. So he um, so the first moment is about the fear and the stifling of the fear, the kind of trying to hold on and not 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 let the, the fear explode. And um, this music in the. We're going to have to stop to go to the second movement, but this music segues to the second movement, which is titled As If in a Dream. And Levy describes small acts of consideration that inmates show to one another or uh, give, sharing a piece of bread or just talking about something sweet. And so I think of it as memories, of, sweet memories of things past. And in this movement... Um, there comes a simple tune that reprises in the finale, which means it comes back later. So we're going to start the second movement from the middle, so you'll hear where this tune comes in, and we'll play that to the end of, of those two movements. So why don't we play the first two movements, and then I'll talk a little more, and we'll play the third and the fourth. Does that work, Mark? Okay.
Now we're gonna hear a little bit of the second movement from the middle of the second movement out. So that's the end of the second movement of To the Spirit Unconquered. And that sweet melody is going to come back. And if you remember the big booming chords that we had that opened the piece, of, I call them the fear chords, they're going to come back too. Um, next, the third movement, we're going to play a little bit of the third movement, which is a traditional scherzo. And that's usually the third movement of a classical sonata, and it's usually a dance. It's usually in three. My scherzo is in five because it's it's called, I think of it as the dance of the barbarians. It's basically the, the, um, the gatekeepers, the guard keepers, they're the barbarians from the perspective of the inmates. It was the guards who were the barbarians. So there's this barbaric dance. And then the music segues uh, to the, what is the fourth movement, but we're going to skip ahead to the fourth movement. And those dark, from those dark chords in the opening that we heard comes the, uh, the, the transcendence, I think, the, the, the music uh, of the tune from the second movement comes back and you hear this kind of transcendence. I don't know what else to say that it is. And uh, that that music then plays off till the end. We're not going to listen to the whole thing, but we're going to hear some of the bar the barbaric scherzo, and then the 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 uh, beginning of the fourth movement, where the mu music from the second mu movement comes back. Okay.
Okay. So that was the um, part of the last movement of the To the Spirit Unconquered. And um, these, by the way, the, the Spirit Unconquered is available uh, online. It's on iTunes and so forth. I, and um, it's on my website. <clears throat> Cello Sonata is probably a little trickier to get, but I just heard that they're going to put that online also for uh, New World Records. And it, it was an early recording, so it, you can watch for it. And it's on my website. You, you can play it off my website. So now we're going to go to the Piano Concerto, which is a <clears throat> last but not least <laughs> of the works you're going to hear tonight. Uh, it's a big piece. It's at least 40 minutes long. Uh, it was premiered at Carnegie Hall in 1995 with Alexander Pally as the pianist with the American Composers Orchestra, and Paul Dunkel conducted. And the recording we're going to hear was made with Pally and the Lithuanian State Orchestra, and it's on the Noxos 21st Century Classics label, and it's wherever you get Noxos recordings, you can get this. And it, too, has a program, but it's a, a little bit of a different program. The first movement... It, it, um, its first movement is about man, youthful man, marching off to meet his face, faith, fate, conquer the world. He's full of arrogance. He's full of naivete, but he's full of that kind of youthful energy. And it's a very blustery, uh, dynamic movement. And um, the second movement, he's suggests the intimacy of prayer. It for me, it evokes the quality of the, the of the synagogue, and. The image is, you know, the, the man is broken and crying. That was an expression that Karl Bach used to always say, broken and crying. It's like when everything has just fallen out from under him and he's praying. And um, uh, we're going to play, because our time is running short, we're going to play just a very sh little bit of the first movement and a very little bit of the second movement because I want to focus on the third movement. And... Uh, so, but I want you to notice how the how the music opens in the with a chant melody in the first movement because that's going to come back and you're going to hear that later, and the second movement is this kind of crying music in the synagogue. So let's just play those first two uh, bits. Mark. <laughs> And that's a picture of Alexander Pally and I working together when he was learning, practicing for his Carnegie debut.
Okay, so that was a little bit of, of, just to give you a flavor for what the first and second movements are about, I wanted to focus on the third movement. And um, the thir in the third movement, uh, I'm waiting for the screen to come back. Here we go. In the third movement, um, it begins with a recitative-like dialogue between um, piano and orchestra and the piano, you know, the man, the piano is the man, and he says, master of the universe, you know, what are, what are you doing to me? How can this be happening? What, where do I go from here? And uh, the, you know, and then from this depth of despair comes um, the dance of life. And, you know, we, as people, you know, as humans, the answer is always you have to embrace life. And I'm often reminded, in, I, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the image. Some of you will remember the movie Zorba the Greek when at the end of the movie all these bad things have happened, but he's kind of on the beach just kind of slowly dancing. It's, it's, that's the image that came to mind. And I will also say that Pally is an enormous talent and has an enormous range of expression. And I wanted, you know, he's in this concerto now, it's, we're into 35 minutes of this concerto. He's been playing lots of bombast and big stuff. And this was the moment for him to be absolutely like a little angel. <laughs> very, very sweet, innocent, childlike. So um, I'm going to go to the piano, and I hope you can hear me from the piano. Can you still hear me? Is it okay? Should I turn the, um, I'm going to turn the microphone that, that way. That yeah, way. we can hear you from there. You can hear yeah, me. We only see, we see the picture of the Sheila. There we go. Oh. <laughs> I'll move my chair. How's that? Okay. So, um, first of all, you remember in the opening, the opening chant music. in the orchestra uh, like this. I need to sing something to you. You know how in, I'm going to go down a little bit so you can see me. You know how in Jewish music they go, yeah, 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 or ba, 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 that kind of a feeling? So he plays the tune on one hand, very, very simply, very free. It feels like it's floating on top of the orchestra. It's not in meter with the orchestra. In fact, the tune has no meter. So let me play that. It's a very simple um, From that very humble beginning is going to come out some huge explosion, little by little by little. And um, the next thing that happens is the left hand of the piano starts going down in groups of seven. You can't see my hand, but I'm going like this. 
and the right hand of the piano plays the tune in its rhythm a little bit more uh, metrically, and it continues to build. So let me play a little bit of that for you. This is already getting pretty hard to play, but I'm going to do my best. getting very virtuosic. So the pianist is going ba 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 like that. And it continues to build and it continues to build. And if you remember in the tune it went dum bum bum ba 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 bum bum bum. Sometimes there's three bums and sometimes there's two. So as we play this music, listen to where the threes and twos are. It's um and it builds and builds till it's enormous and the uh, xylophone at the very end is way on top, going da 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 da, doing that same music with the piano. So you'll kind of hear this go from this intimacy to this enormous moment. So let's hear that.
Okay, that's the temperature, and that's it's time to questions. I think, yeah. <laughs> okay, Mark. So, Sh Sheila, thank you so much. Thank that you. I, I, thank you. I, maybe if we have some time at the end, we can hear the end of the work. I, I feel like I'm, <laughs> you know, if, at the edge of my seat. If uh, you know that. That's a very fun moment. That that big the yeah. xylophone player and the pianist going together is just crazy. But uh, listen to it. It's on my website. It's wherever Noxos is. You can stream it. You can listen to it. You can buy it. The CD. If you still buy CDs, you can buy it. Download it. So, so does so anybody we, have questions? We'd love to open this up. If any of you, um, you can. Um, uh, go ahead and unmute yourselves, and we can unmute you. And uh, if you want to, there's a raise your hand function, or if you want to put something in the chat, we'd love to uh, interact with Sheila and happy to have you ask your questions. And again, Sheila, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> there's this beautiful reaction button where you can, you know, <laughs> provide a clap hand. So. We can keep on doing that. So does anyone have a question? You can raise your hand button. There's a hand button. Where you oh, this is your sister. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I must say that I always thought all these years that when you were singing that song on a Friday night over the bracha, that it was an old song. I never realized, I'm embarrassed to say, that you actually composed it, and I love it so much. <laughs> And I also love the concerto. I remember so well that you, when you went to Carnegie Hall with that concerto, it was very important and amazing. And uh, I still remember that day. As sisters, we were always, she was always there for everything. <laughs> still am. <laughs> Hello, Michael Levitt. I see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, you know, I know your choral music. Yeah. From the Greg Smith singers years yes. and years ago. It's, it was interesting for me to, to hear uh, that lyric, uh, that lyricism all through your music, but hearing much denser and more complex uh, chords and particularly such piano driven uh, things. I never realized actually you were a pianist, but obviously you are by, by your writing. And yeah. um, it's, it's wonderful writing. And, and like Mark, I, I want to hear the end of the piece. <laughs> the tune well, comes, in a few minutes. comes back at the end. <laughs> in a grand yeah, minutes, way. We, we could yeah. certainly play the last few, last few minutes. You want to play the last three minutes? Want to hear the end of the concerto? Put it on. The last three minutes. This is the last three minutes where the it's the grand finale where the you'll hear there's an echo. The piano initiates and then things spin out through the whole orchestra. It's it's, it's it, and then it's 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 at eighteen oh six or something like that. Mark has been moving dials all along to get these excerpts, and it's not an easy thing to do.
it has a gentle ending. Hi, Sheila. Hi, it's, Diane. It's Diane Rubenstein. Thank you so much for sending me the link to this. I, I extraordinary. It is hard to find words. I noticed you did the same to describe music in words. But hearing it, hearing your music, I need to sit with it. I need to be able to hear it in and meditate with it because it deserves to be listened to quietly. And we certainly have the time and place to do that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm sitting here in uh, 70 degree weather, glorious sunny day over here on the West Coast. So um, I'm hoping we can meet up again, but mostly I'm looking forward to hearing your music. You're extraordinarily talented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. So Sheila, one question uh, that I have for you is, you know, in listening to this, there, there are two things I noticed I would love you to comment on and if they're irrelevant, just let me know. Uh, one is that there's, you have, at least in the portions that we heard, there's such a strong motivic base to, to the music and there's this beautiful organic quality that as you hear it, you keep on hearing something you've heard and it just sort of continues and grows and just sort of like, gets within you in a very beautiful way. And I'm curious, you know, in many of your other works, if that motivic base is something that you use uh, consistently. And the other thing is, you know, um, in hearing the end of this piece and some of the soft, warm, touching moments, I sort of hear like Tibetan bowls in my ears. <laughs> I just wonder if the, you know, your love for Tibetan bowls just becomes part of your aesthetic and sound world through some of the orchestration. Well. You know, yes, I am a motivic. I, I use motives, okay? I mean, a lot of modern music doesn't, you know. That, that's just not who I am. And uh, I, you know, I also come from the discipline where, you know, you come up with an idea. You, you can't have too many ideas in a piece. You have to You It's part of the craft of a composer, just like the craft of somebody writing a book, you can't keep bringing in new characters over, you know, through the whole piece. You have to keep, you have to use the material you have. There's a drama. You, you know, in page one of a book, you're introducing something. You page first measures of a piece, you're introducing the idea, and you ha and you're obligated to work with it. That's my, perhaps old-fashioned view, but that's the view that I have. And I, I think of music. You know, when I'm laying, laying out a, a, a story, it's a narrative. And so the, th the characters come back, the ideas come back. Um, the ultimate is the form of opera, and which suits me very well because I get, you know, once you, you have leitmotifs, basically. And um, uh, so, yes, I, 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 you know, sometimes material comes back, like in the piano concerto. I hadn't looked at it a long time, and somebody has been practicing it, and I... She called me and wanted some pointers, and I, and I suddenly started to say, "Oh, I, you know, there's that passage there. I never knew where that came from." And then all of a sudden, I knew where it came from. It's like sometimes things come to you and you don't know. Oh, that's this. You just write it because you think it's got to be there, and I don't know why it has to be there, but it has to be there. And then, you know, twenty years later, I look at it and I think it's obvious why it's there. So that that happens to me sometimes when you go back and revisit a piece, and. Um, as for the Tibetan bulls, I didn't discover them until 2003 or four. That was the first time I used one. So I didn't know about them in there, but I've always loved percussion and there's always, my pieces are all, always heavily percussive. And um, so that's, that's the only thing I can say about that. Thank you. I, I have a quick question. Um, sure. I was just wondering the, uh, Specifically about your harmonic language, when we were listening to like uh, the Spirit on Conquer, and I was thinking, oh wow, it's very cool, crunchy, not uh, not necessarily completely atonal, like there's tonal centers, but but pretty loose. And then by the, and then I, I was shocked when we get to the piano concerto, 
which is in this beautiful modal world, there's there's always something you can grasp onto. And I was just curious. So you, you have a, a real range in terms of your language. And I was just curious, you know, how you employ that. What, what did it have to do with the story you were trying to tell in the music? Or if you could just elaborate on that, I'd be really interested. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned this before, you know, I was, you know, my 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 career as a composer began when I was a little bit late, when I was in my late, when I was in my early 20s. I guess that's late. I, I was always a pianist, but women weren't composers in those days, so my my course to being a composer was a little bit circuitous. And, um, uh and but the time I was studying in the in the see I went to graduate school around sixty nine sixty eight somewhere sixty six I was in Europe in sixty six, and everything was very you know atonal and nobody mm-hmm. wrote tonal melodies and where I went to graduate school you know you, you just didn't do it you know and so immediately upon leaving graduate school I started doing it and and and. It's always been for me. I mean, I I am very, can be very critical of tonal music that doesn't reflect a perspective that is. If it sounds like it's night, could have been written by like a, like a Brahms master. You know, if it sounds like it came out of the nineteenth century to my ears, I I lose interest in it pretty quick. Mm-hmm. I want a perspective. I I want to use it, but I want a perspective that says we're here now. And my entire life has been about blending. I mean, I have a very wide range. Yes, and it's how do you put them together and that it doesn't sound like it's a like it's a, a mishmash. You know, it has to be organic and it has to and, and like and so that's that's what I do in every piece I have this wide range and I can use it depending upon the the emotion and of course again with you know I keep coming back to opera I'm, I'm I you know my early days I wrote my first opera around the time of uh, the cello sonata and but I waited 20 years to hear it played and then after that my my life as an opera composer really you know, started to take off, but it, you know, you know, it's, it's uh, opera also allows you this narrative, gives you a narrative, you get a story and you don't have to apologize for the story. And then, because, you know, some people think that you can't write program music, but I love having narratives in my music because it, a story helps me focus my emotional focus. And I don't always, I don't know, you know, a lot of the story comes sometimes it's, you don't, it's unconscious. It, it's there vaguely. And then after the piece is done, you think, oh, that's this. And I can give that over to the audience and it helps them perceive it. But um, uh, anyway, I, I have the whole span and I have to use it according to what, what the drama requires at the moment and the emotion and the heart. It's always, a, in the end, it's always about the feeling, you know. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, Sheila, we thank you so much for starting off our virtual Jewish Music Masterclass, and we've come into your living room, and we thank you for letting us join you uh, in that way, and a a big thanks, and we put Sheila's um, website links uh, in the chat, and you could just find her, Sheila Silver. I'm also putting into the chat uh, a link to our Low Milk and Fun for American Jewish Music at UCLA, and there you can find there or you can follow us on our Facebook um, page uh, for more events. And next week we will have um, uh, another event uh, at the same time. And we're having Vasya Schechter, uh, another New York uh, musician. Uh, uh, and it will be again at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. on the West Coast. So um, thank you all for joining us. And once again, a big thanks to you, Sheila. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.